Open up your Bibles this morning to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 37, and I'm going to give you part two of a message that I began several weeks ago before I went on vacation. My message is entitled, I'll Not Be a Fretter, Part Two. I'll Not Be a Fretter, Part Two. I think at this day and age, we need a message like this, don't you? I'll not be a fretter. So, beloved, uh, let's go to the throne. Of, I mean, let's stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 right through to verse number 9. So a little lengthy portion of Scripture, but I think you'll see that it's needful as we discuss this. David said, Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like grass, and withers like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwelt in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. That's the evildoer. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and for, uh, uh, forsake wrath. You know, you can get mad at a lot of people when you see what they're doing, can't you? The evil that they're doing. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Beloved, the reason he says in verse number 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath and fret not thyself in any wise to do evil is because when we see evil being perpetrated upon us, we want naturally our own human nature wants to retaliate in kind. And so he's saying don't do it. And he promises us if we don't do it, those who are righteous are going to inherit the earth. Amen. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we discuss this subject, I'll not be a fretter. Father, I'm praying that your power, your grace, your spirit would be present. Lord, that you'd anoint the word, that you stir up our hearts, Lord God. Lord, that we'd rest in thee, commit our way unto thee, trust in thee, Lord God. And Father, we would see that you would bring it to pass. Those things that we need in our life, you'd bring it to pass. Father, anoint this preacher with feet of clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, I want to give you a basic review of part one that I preached uh, several weeks ago so I can kind of get you up to snuff. It's needful that I do it. Um, I was just going to, if I was preaching the following week, I was just going to jump right into point number two. But a few weeks ago, beloved, we saw that God alone is in sovereign control of this world. Amen. Now listen to me, it's important that you understand that precept. Why is that, Pastor Joel? Because not Biden's in control of this world. No government or Congress or the Department of Justice is not in control of this world. The FBI, the Fascist Bureau of Invest I mean the Federal Bureau of Investigation, they're not in charge of this world. The Democrats and the liberal left or the Republicans aren't in charge of this world. Putin's certainly not in charge of this world. China's not in charge of this world. And Satan is not in charge of this world. Now, beloved, God temporarily allows Satan to be the god of this evil world system. Uh, but, beloved, we saw how Christ defeated him at the cross. And right now, the devil but reigns over a dark and doomed and damned domain. The Bible says in Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show on them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is the cross. He triumphed over all principalities and powers, and that's why we're to pray to God when Satan attacks us, when demons attack us, because he's been exalted high above every principality and power and domain. Would you say amen? And so that's why we need to understand that. He's the Lord, not them. Would you say amen? So, beloved, when Christ returns, you'll throw Satan and you'll throw all his demons and minions into the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of the lake of fire. But till then, but till then, ladies and gentlemen, God uses Satan and demons. Till then, God uses nations and governments and corrupt politicians. Till then, 
God uses corrupt global leaders. Every trial, trouble, tribulation, and crisis that befalls us in such a chaotic world. Why? To work out the counsel of his own will to fulfill his redemptive plan and purpose for man. God is working things out. Would you say amen out there? And so we need to understand that because if you just walk by sight and not by faith, you're going to be really fretting and fearful. So, beloved, we also studied point number one. And point number one was the strong admonition. The strong admonition, if you take a note. I want you to look at verses 1 and 2 and verse 9. David says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like uh, grass, and wither as the green herb. Drop down to verse number 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. In other words, beloved, we saw how the words fret not, kara, means this. It means we're not to get so upset. We're not to get so troubled. We're not to get so disturbed at what we see going on with all of the problems and all of the pressures of this world, beloved. Get so upset that you churn and burn inside with fear and anger, that you you churn and burn inside with worry and anxiety. And a lot of people are panicking today. That you churn and uh, burn inside, beloved, with nervous concern over them. Why? Because our God, now listen to me, our God is still on the throne of the universe. And he's in sovereign control over them all. And he is using them to fulfill his prophecy in accordance, the Bible says, with his good pleasure. Come on and say amen out there. So what am I saying to you? So I'll not be a worrier. So I'll not be a pessimist. So I'll not be a defeatist, so I'll not be a fretter over what's going on in this corrupt and chaotic and convoluted world, beloved. Why? Because God says in verse 9 that the wicked are going to be cut off, but you and I are going to inherit the new heavens and the new earth. Would you say amen out there? You know, the meek, Jesus said, shall inherit the earth. And so next we studied on the point number one that there were three sub-points. The first thing we saw, number one, was the evildoers. Look at verse 1a. Fret not thyself against evildoers. In other words, we mustn't fret about their evil and wicked people and politicians of this world because we saw how God uh, will utterly destroy them. But conversely, he will deliver us. He will bless the righteous, and the Bible says he will take them to heaven. Secondly, beloved, we saw not only the evildoers, but we saw the envy. Look what he says in verse 1b. He says, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. In other words, neither should we be uh, jealous and envy these workers of iniquity or these urbane global elitists because of their ill-gotten gains and wealth. It's easy to do when you see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Amen? If, If we did not have the Spirit of God inside of us, we would implode and explode when we see the ill-gotten gains of what's going on, where the average person uh, uh, picking up cans is paying more taxes than the richest rich person and the Hollywood elites and the government elites. So why, beloved, why shouldn't we envy this? For this is the only heaven the Bible says that they're ever going to know, and the riches they get in this life are the only riches they'll ever have. And sadly, ladies and gentlemen, most also are going to lose their souls and because of their impenitent sin, and it's a shame, beloved, that this will happen, while God says that's their choice that they made, but if you choose to be righteous, you're going to inherit eternity. So, beloved, we saw the, the evildoers, we saw their envy, and thirdly, the third subpoint on the point number one, to keep you up to snuff, is we saw their end. Their end. Look in verse number two. He says, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. In God's sight, notice these evildoers, these workers of iniquity are seen by him as being utterly worthless and useless as dead grass and herbal clippings. I take them and I put them in a pile, beloved. I separate the, 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 the uh, weeds out of them. And I use them for fertilizer. I let them all degenerate, and I use them into compost, and I work them into my garden. And that's the only thing they're good for, by the way. <laughs> so you can see how God compares them to them. He says in the text that if he'll cut them down, namal, that is, they'll be brought down to the grave. 
They'll be brought down to hell by God and they'll perish in the burning, boiling, bubbling pit of hell, beloved, while the righteous will live forever in the eternal kingdom of God in a new, immortal, glorified body. Everybody ought to say hallelujah and glory to God. Amen. <laughs> I can't wait to get rid of this old chassis. A lot of miles on it. Hard miles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. But anyways, beloved, so we need not fear is what I'm saying. We need not fret. We need not worry or be anxious or overly concerned about what we see going on in the world today regarding inflation, regarding recession or crime and lawlessness, regarding the war with Ukraine and Russia, beloved, the border crisis, regarding our political leaders and corruption. For the Lord God alone is in sovereign control who, uh, who rules over all of this. There's things that he allows, there's things that he prevents. That's his sovereign choice. And he has the omnipotent, almighty, supernatural power to be able to do it. Would you say amen out there? So that was point number one, beloved, the strong admonition. Let's begin anew today with point number two, the spiritual advice. The spiritual advice. Look what he says in verse 3a. 3a. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. You know, Romans 12, 21 tells us that we're to overcome evil with good, and I always add to get better. We're to overcome evil with good, and I add, as I told you, and get better. Why? Because God promises here that we can dwell permanently and prosperously with him by daily practicing these two things. He says you must have, number one, faith, and number two, he says you must have faithfulness. Now let's discuss the sub-point number one, faith. You must have faith. Look at verse 3a. He says, trust in the Lord. Now that word trust, batak, that is you must have strong, unwavering belief. You must have strong, unwavering confidence and certainty. And beloved, listen to me, and conviction in this divine being called, notice what it says here, the Lord. All uppercase letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now, why did David write that in all capital uh, letters and not in lowercase, capital L, small o, r, d? Because, beloved, he knows what he's talking about here. He's telling us to trust in Yehovah. He's telling us to trust in the great I Am, the sovereign and supreme eternal self-existent one, the only uncaused cause and creator and redeemer and ruler God of the universe, the one who is the King of kings, the one who is the Lord of lords, ladies and gentlemen, and his son Jesus Christ, trusting in him as your personal risen Lord and Savior. Come on and say amen out there. I've taught you before the Yehovah of the Old Testament was the Yeshua of the New Testament. Would you say amen? He was the God incarnate in the flesh, fully God, fully man, the Theanthropos, the God-man. You know, beloved, in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says this, that without faith it's impossible to please God, but he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists, that he's there and is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Do you diligently seek the Lord? You know, beloved, i got to tell you, the older I get, and Lord knows I, my wife uh, during vacation, my first six hours, five to six hours I do every day, I study and pray. And I did it all during my vacation, okay? Why? Because the more I know about the Lord, the more I know I don't know about the Lord, the more I know I need to know about the Lord, the more I want to know about the Lord. And so you study because there's so much to learn, beloved, and it's going to take not only a lifetime but an eternity to learn about this great Lord and King. Amen? But without faith, if I did not believe that he was in sovereign control, that he was the Lord God of heaven and earth, that he was the creator, the redeemer, the savior, the sanctifier, the one who's in sovereign control, you know what? I'd throw my hat into the ring and say, that's it. How about you? You see, beloved, what he's saying is this. You must have faith in his person and power. You must have faith in his promises that he's promised you. You must have faith in his pardon, his precepts. What he wrote is the infallible word of God. I, I, on vacation, I, I read the book, the, the, uh, How the King James Version Came to, uh, to Be. Beloved, I've read many before about the manuscripts and, and the codexes and all of that. 
But this writer broke it down simple, and I wish every person here could read the book and see what we take for granted with this King James Version of the Bible. I wish you could see it, beloved, in the multitudes of godly men who were burned at the stake and ripped apart and chased and killed and imprisoned just so we could have the Word of God. They said so that the plowman behind the plow would know more than the Roman Catholic priest behind the pulpit who knew nothing about the Word of God. And we take it for granted so many times, and we let it sit on our coffee table and collect dust instead of reading the infallible Word of God. But we must also trust, beloved, in His protection. God promises to protect us, and in His providence. He rules and overrules in the everyday affairs of man. I'm going to let that happen in your life, Joel. I'm not going to let this happen in your life, Joel. This is good for you. Listen to me now, beloved. The furnace of affliction is not to destroy someone, it's to refine someone. The metallurgist, the blacksmith knows that the ore and the metal he's putting into the fire must be worth, it must be invaluable because he wants it to be even better when he gets all the dross out of it, amen? So God allows a lot of things in our life, beloved. Why? Because he's refining us in the furnace of affliction and he's got his hand on the thermostat. He turns it up when he needs to and he turns it down when he needs to. Come on and say amen out there. So the furnace of affliction is not to destroy you, it's to perfect you and correct you in this life. And beloved, we must believe that he will truly take care of us as he promises to do in his word. So my question to you is, do you truly believe all this about the Lord, Yehovah? And, and, and what I'm saying, beloved, is do you trust his promise in Hebrews 13, 5, that he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe that? Do you believe he'll never leave you nor forsake you? Because the devil's whispering in your ear in the middle of your problem, God's left here, he don't care about you. See what happened? I'd never let that happen to my children. I've told you the battlefield is your heart and your mind, and that's why the Bible says we're to put on the helmet of salvation. Would you say amen? To protect ourselves from all these fiery darts that Satan throws at us. Beloved, you must, uh, uh, I'm saying, do you trust in his promise in 1 Peter 5, 7, that you're to cast all your cares upon him? Why? Because the Bible says he careth for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe and trust his promise, beloved, in James 4, 8, that if you draw nigh to God, he is going to draw nigh to you? Imagine that, beloved, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, this sovereign God that we cannot see with our eyes except for the eye of faith, that he says that if I'll get close to him, he'll draw ever so close to me. Oh, what incentive to be able to do that. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, you trust in his promise in Philippians 4.19 that your God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Believe that? When Satan says, see, you're going to go without here. You're not going to have any money to pay that bill. God says, I'm going to provide all of your need. Amen. I've been around on the top side of this earth for a while, and you know what? God has provided every need that I've ever had. Now, there's been a lot of wants that I wanted that he didn't give me, but my needs, he provided all of my needs. Come on and say amen out there. But but do you believe in uh, 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 1 Peter 5, 7, when he says you're to cast all your care upon him because he cares for you? Do you believe that? Do you believe God cares for you? Do you believe God really cares for you? Moms and dads, think about how much you care for your children. And that's nothing compared to how Christ compares for us, uh, cares for us. That's absolutely nothing. We don't even know what true love, perfect love is yet, beloved, and we won't until we're glorified. And perfect love, the Bible says, casts out fear. That is of judgment it's talking about in 1 John chapter 3. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying if you believe these things, then you need not fret or fear what man can do to you. You need not fret or fear what is happening today in the United States of America. You need not uh, uh, fret or fear, beloved, what is geopolitically going on in this world. Why? Because if you truly... <laughs> we'll be here till three now. <laughs> I did that on purpose, you know. <laughs> I'm saying, beloved, you truly trust in the Lord as exhorted here to do, then you know this. You know that God himself is in the driver's seat. Amen. Behind the scenes in this world, beloved, providentially steering all things, steering all events. 
He's steering all actions and leaders to fulfill his will, to fulfill his plan, to fulfill his purpose, to fulfill his desired end. God has a plan, beloved, and it has to be worked out in real time. Now, we look at eternity, and we're just a blip in that continuum of time, but God is working that little blip out so we can uh, be absorbed and conform to the rest of the continuum of time. Would you say amen out there? The earth is the only planet in the universe that has rebelled against God. And Jesus came from heaven. He's the kingdom of heaven down to this earth to bring us back into harmony and conformity with the kingdom of God. Would you say amen out there? So, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. In Proverbs 21.1, listen to me now. The Bible says this, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Imagine that. And as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Daniel 2.21 says that God removes kings and he sets up kings. He told Nebuchadnezzar, I'm giving you the world. And then he told Cyrus, king of Persia, you're going to destroy Nebuchadnezzar and I'm going to give you the world and you're going to let my people go. You're going to have them build or rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. God, it's God who removes kings. It's God who sets up kings. You say, well, I don't like the president, the president we have right now. God gave you just what you deserve. You hear me now? You know, everybody gets self-righteous. You know, they don't want to, it's when they hit their pocketbook and they start getting a little concerned about what's going on in the world, amen? And that's a sad fact. They don't care what's happening spiritually. They don't care what's happening morally in this world, only politically when it affects them financially. And that's a sad fact. Listen to me now. What am I saying to you? I'm saying he's a conductor of an orchestra, beloved. Like he leads the musicians to play a symphony. God likewise leads the world's leaders. He's like a divine conductor. He's like a divine choreographer to orchestrate, play, and fulfill this masterful com uh, composition of his redemptive plan for man. I shouldn't just say redemptive, re redemptive and reputive plan for man, because when he comes back, he's going to repudiate billions on this earth. Now, that's a sad fact, but that's the truth of the Word of God. Amen? You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 40 and verse 15a that the nations are but a drop in the bucket to God. Imagine that, a drop in the bucket. The Bible says in Isaiah 40 and verse 15b that the nations are small dust on the balance. That is the scale. That's what nations are before God. The Bible says in Isaiah 40 verse 17 that all the nations of the world are as nothing to God. Now, love it. With all of the might that they have with their planes and their rockets and their nuclear weapons, God says, that's nothing to me. I'm the one that made the atoms. And the nuclear uh, uh, physicist who looks at it says, it's still a mystery to me how we can split these electrons, neutrons, croutons, protons, and have such a massive explosion as this. We only understood that great God that we serve. Amen. I'll not be a fretter. I'll not be a fretter. How about you? I'll not be a fretter, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the sovereign and supernatural eternal God will someday utterly crush, the Bible says, and conquer all the temporal kingdoms of this world when the Lord Jesus Christ returns at the second advent. Then, says Revelation eleven fifteen. then the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he, not they, but he shall reign forever and ever. Amen? Handel's Messiah, God of God forever, forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Right? The Bible says he shall reign. He shall reign, ladies and gentlemen, forever and ever. Not the United States of America, not China, not Russia, not NATO, not the Antichrist, but the Lord Jesus Christ shall rule and reign forever and ever. Therefore, because I believe this, beloved, to be absolutely and inviolably true, I'm not going to worry, and I'm not a worrier. My wife will tell you, I do not worry. I do not worry. I've learned, I was brought up on the wrong side of the spoon, so I, had a, I learned not to worry afterward. Things work itself out, and God's always had my back. And so, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'll not get upset 
It's so easy to get up. I said, let's just find out, Ellie, what's going on, and then we're going to watch Gunsmoke. <laughs> well, you see John Wayne. Well, I always watch, you ever watch him? He walks sideways. <laughs> Come on, pilgrim. I'll tell you what I'm going to do right now. That'd be 50 cents for that act, by the way. <laughs> but let me listen to me. I'm not getting upset. I'm not going to fret as I see the self-destructive implosion and collapse of this evil and wicked and unjust world daily unfolding all around me. I expect it to happen. I read about it daily in the Word of God that it's going to happen. How about you? People walk around, as if that's going to change something, right? Let's get a new president. Well, maybe we should, beloved, but I'll tell you something. Things are going to be as usual. The deep state is just that. It's deep. And you see when someone tries to drain the swamp, what they'll do to you. Amen? So the only one's going to be able to do that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying true faith and trust believes that the Lord's still in charge of all that's happening, that the Lord's still in control. He's in command of all that's happening in this world. Amen? So instead of filling my mind with all of the discouraging and depressing and demoralizing negative and critical news that liberal and conservative political pundits and rhetoric espoused by these new news commentators uh, espoused, beloved, me thinks I'm going to do what Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 says, and I'm going to fill my mind, as Paul says to do, listen to me, he says, with whatsoever things are true, with whatsoever things are honest and just and pure, with whatsoever things are lovely, with whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, and the God of peace will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Would you say amen out there? You want to focus on something? Focus on that, not chasing the news all the time. It'll do nothing but get you depressed. So, beloved, doing this will encourage you and edify you and not depress or discourage you and demoralize you like it's doing to a lot of people. So the psalmist's spiritual advice is for you uh, to have an unshakable faith in God's sovereign being in control over this world, beloved, and trust in the Lord in the midst of all this chaos and trust in the Lord in the midst of all this madness and this turmoil, beloved, and not man. We are to walk by faith, I told you, and not by sight. If I walk by sight, I'm going to see what man's doing. If I walk by faith, I'm going to see what God's doing. How about you? See, people are so focused on what man's doing right now, and Christians getting caught up in the politics of everything. It amazes me, beloved. They know more about politicians than you do about the prophets. And that's a sad fact. And we shouldn't. Because Paul, nor any writer, ever told us to rebel against the government. The Bible says if the government passes laws that tell you to disobey God's law, and, uh, Acts 5.29 is best to obey God rather than man. And that. He never told us to protest the government. He never told us to do a lot of these things that people are doing today. They're upset. Why? They have no hope. They want new leaders in, but these new leaders come in with fallen hearts like the rest of us. And unless you have a new heart inside you, beloved, you're going to do things that are politically expedient and you're going to succumb to bribes and everything else that the deep state will give you. And so we need to understand that. So that was the first point, beloved. Faith. Faith. You ought to have faith. Secondly, he says you ought to have faithfulness. So we, uh, 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 our faith must move us to have faithfulness. Look what he says in verse 3b. He says, and do good. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Do good. Asatov. It means to obey God's commandments. It means to live such a holy, righteous, and godly life in God's sight that he sees you as being a true, morally, and spiritually just, and upright, and listen to me, decent person worthy of his favor. So now he will richly reward you for your doing good. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. It means both here in this life, he's going to take care of you, and also hereafter, in the next life, he's going to take care of you. You see, beloved, here in this life, he'll not provide everything that you need to thrive, survive, and stay alive. Come on and say amen. I'm saying no matter how bad the economy gets, I'm saying no matter how loud the war dreams, drums in this world beat, 
I'm saying no matter uh, 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 how our good, bad, or indifferent political leaders may be, if you still do good, even in the bad times, if you'll still be faithful to God while others are being unfaithful. I've seen so many Christians saying, you know what? I've tried to live this life good. I've tried to be good. Look what's happening right now. Everybody else is doing it. I'm just going to go along with the crowd. Believe me, you're committing spiritual suicide. Don't run with the crowd. Don't run. With. It's always been the remnant. The simple few that hang on to God and say, God said it. I believe it. I must not look around me. I must walk by faith. I must hold on to this, that this is true. And a lot of people think, you know what, I'm going to run with the devil's crowd. And then, you know, in the end, because I profess Christ as Savior, I'm going to go to heaven to boo. That's not true, beloved. That's just not true. And don't fall for that. Beloved, if you still dedicate and devote yourself to serving the Lord and His church and continue trusting Him in the midst of all of these difficulties, in the midst of all of these hardships and problems, beloved, then God will supernaturally protect and provide for you. Why? Because you're doing good. You've done good in His sight. Amen? Then God will supernaturally comfort and console you. Why? Because you've done good in His sight then God will supernaturally give you the peace of God, that inner peace of heart and soul and mind that passes all understanding, beloved. Why? Because you've done good when it was hard to do, but you've still done good. That's right, English, right? You've done good, girl. You've done good, boy. <laughs> it's easy to follow the devil's crowd, isn't it? Our nature and our flesh wants to bend that way. We must override it with the supernatural power of God's Spirit and grace inside of us on that new man that he's implanted in us. Amen? So, beloved, I'll not be your fretter. Why? Because I know that God is my divine protector and he's my provider. I'll not be a fretter because I know God is my peace in this world. And, beloved, he gives me peace in the midst of you. I came back to work last Sunday. I opened up my computer from top to bottom People wrote me. <laughs> and a lot of people don't want to talk to you in person or want to talk to you on the phone. They want it written down, they said, so I can have it as a record and I can refer back to it. Do you know how long that takes, beloved, when you're trying to do a lot of other things? You just want to say, look, get on the horn, you know, and try to remember this. <laughs> uh, but, beloved, I, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'm saying to you that God is my pavilion. What do you mean by that, Pastor Joel? He's my pavilion in whom I'll take refuge and rest amidst all the unrest and uncertainties in this chaotic world. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, what does he say? He says, be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds in peace through Christ Jesus. Would you say amen? Now, you wonder if that's true, why are so many Christians so upset? Because they won't do it. Because they won't do it. I'm going to find out what's going on in the news. I've got to find out what's going on in the news. I've got to see what they're saying right now. This one here, I'm going to block this one. And that's amazing to me, beloved, honestly. I could give a rip less. You know, it's, uh, everybody's talking about how, uh, you know, everybody's tapping your phones right now and they're selling all these, these uh, uh, apps that you can get to prevent people from tracking you or whatever. I said, don't bother me in the least. I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> They're going to say, this guy doesn't exist. <laughs> God must have took him to heaven already. <laughs> you know, beloved, I don't care about Facebook. I don't care about any of that. Whatever's happening, if people want to contact me. Everybody's known where I've lived. In fact, I, you know, I, somebody sent me something. I Googled my name. I never did that before. And I looked at it, and half the stuff they wrote about me, I said, is this the same guy? And there's about four other Joels around here. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> I kept getting these calls from the police department and threatening, uh, this was a few, a few years ago, and threatening uh, letters. And so one day I was in my office and the police called. And they said, uh, you are late, uh, 
you, there's warrants been served on you, you're late for court. I says, wait a minute. I says, who is this Joel Batello? Where does he live? And they said, he lives in Plymouth. I said, uh oh. <laughs> I said, how old is he? He said, he's 27. I said, that's me. <laughs> I said, you got the wrong fella. I says, I'm in my late 60s at that time. I says, I'm in my late 60s. I says, you got the wrong fella. But so what they must have done was Googled all these other Joels, and they put them all together, and then they put them under my name. And you know, they had me going to Harvard. <laughs> Harvard, you know, governor. Chitty old pip pip and all that rot, you know. <laughs> they had me doing all kinds of things. I was a brain surgeon. Or is that a sturgeon? One or the other. I love fishing. Okay. I don't know, beloved, but I'm, what I'm saying to you simply is this here. Is that I'm not worried about that. I'm not anxious about that. I'm anxious of crossing the finish line and getting into the kingdom of God. How about you? Everything else. If I lost my house tomorrow, God will provide a tent. No matter what, beloved, God, I've got a mansion in heaven, and so don't you. Amen? I'm going to walk the streets of gold, and so aren't you. So I'm not worried about what this world's going to do. I expect the world to do nasty things to me. And they do, by the way, as a pastor, I'll tell you. So why fret, beloved, when hereafter in the next life you'll also see and be with God forever. Amen? In the next life, beloved, you're going to have eternal life. In the next life, you're going to live in the eternal kingdom of God. Listen to me. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 13, 14. This is for here. That is, in this life, we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That is, hereafter. Amen? I'm not looking at earthly Jerusalem like the dispensationalists and most of the people on the uh, uh, neo-evangelicals on the radio and dispensationalists are saying on the radio. The Bible says here we have no continuing city. We're looking for the new Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. That was a type of the heavenly Jerusalem. Come on and say amen out there. Here we have no... If we, whoever wrote the uh, book of Hebrews, I told you, probably it was Apollos or it could have been Timothy... It probably could have been Tom, I told you, I don't know. We don't know for sure, but it wasn't Paul. But we know this, that he says here, because the Jews were obsessed with the city of Jerusalem, the dispensationists have fallen the Zionists of the Jews, the unsaved giant, and they're still fixated on where? Now, I'm not against Jerusalem. What I'm saying is that biblically, the Bible says that God is not focused on the earthly Jerusalem, it's on the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly Zion. Let's see if I remember it. Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the heavenly Jerusalem, and to a numerous company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn written to heaven, and to God, this, uh, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, uh, sprinkling and speaketh better things than that of Abel. So I've not come unto the earthly Zion, I've come where? Jesus is in the heavenly Zion, not the earthly Zion. He's where is he? He's in the heavenly Zion. And that's where we're headed, the celestial city of God. And so we need to get our heads on right and start studying the Bible and stop listening to these false prophets that are prophesying the Zionist uh, uh, hope. They rejected the Lord as the Savior. And they'll know the truth when they come to know Jesus. And that's what we're praying, Father. They would get saved, amen, and become true Jews. And come to know the Lord Jesus, their Messiah, Yahushua. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying I'll not be a, a, a fretter because of, number one, the strong admonition. I'll not be a fretter because of, the number two, the spiritual advice. Now let's look at point number three, and I'll go right through this because I've got 45, um, no, <laughs> I've got about 11 minutes to go here. Number three, beloved, the sovereign's assurance. The sovereign's assurance. I want you to look at verse 3b. He says, not only do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Now God assures all those who fret not like this, and who constantly and continuously trust in him, two things. Number one, he tells us there'll be prosperity now. And number two, he shows us permanence later. Now, I kind of turned them around for a reason. But those are the two things, prosperity now and permanence later. In other words, he says you'll be fed. That is that you'll be fed a flourishing, 
uh, pro uh, prosperous and productive life throughout all your days here on this earth. And number two, he says about dwelling. In other words, permanence later. That is, they'll forever dwell in the promised land of the new heaven and the new earth in all eternity. So God assures us that both now and later that we'll be fed with his divine love, fed with his divine joy, fed with his divine bliss, fed with his divine uh, peace, fed with his divine life, beloved. So I'll not be a fretter, amen. I want God to feed me his word. I want God to feed me his peace. I want God to feed me his strength. I want God to feed me his power. How about you? I want God to do the feeding in my life, not the world, not the news commentators. I want God to feed me on feast on the word of God. Amen. So don't the worry, be happy. Didn't you love that song? So don't the worry, your rent is late. <laughs> don't the worry, be happy. You ever have somebody start laughing in front of you? You didn't know why they were laughing, but they were belly laughing. All of a sudden, you started getting caught up in it, and you're with them. <laughs> what are you laughing about? I don't know. <laughs> you know how good you felt afterwards because all the endorphins your mind secreted and the serotonin, and you say, oh, man, I feel so good right now, and you slept like a baby, right? I remember one time it happened with my wife and I. She said, Joel, what's up? And why are you laughing so hard? I said, tell you. <laughs> and I'm laughing. And then she starts laughing. She got me laughing. I got her laughing. We're still laughing after 53 years of marriage. <laughs> we have fun in our house. I don't know about you, but we have fun. I, <clears throat> I've, got, I've got these little... <clears throat> Remember years ago, when you'd go to a store, there would be a bubblegum machine there. And they would have little mice in there, little animals, and you'd put the quarter in, <laughs> and it's going to come out. Well, I saved all of them. <laughs> so I take it, and I put it in the shower, and Ellie goes in, ah! <laughs> Joel, and she throws it out of the bathroom at me, right? And then I've got a little uh, cockroach, a little cockroach. And uh, I put it under the sheets, and Ellie says, good night, honey. <laughs> Joel, you always get me like this. Then I got this huge spider, and I put it in the, this, this, uh, hallway and it's dark, right? She comes walking out, oh, Joe, look at her. <laughs> In other words, beloved, don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Keep some spice in your life, right, beloved, and stop looking at what's going on all around you. I also have a rubber snake. I put that under her pillow. <laughs> she, she sleeps in her belly, so she puts her hands there. Oh, no. What's the matter, Ellie? I'm afraid to move. There's a snake here. <gasps> My goodness. Wait a minute. Let me go get the gun, Ellie. <laughs> what I'm saying to you, beloved, is this here. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen? Isn't that what Nehemiah said? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Stop being so somber. Stop fretting. Stop worrying. And stop all these other things on social media so you can start focusing on the Lord and have some joy, <coughs> excuse me, in your heart. So what I'm saying, beloved, is that worry can never <coughs> rob tomorrow of its pain and sorrow, but it can and does steal the joy out of today. Amen? What I'm saying is that worry can never take away tomorrow's woes and troubles, but it can and it does take away today's peace and tranquility in your life. And what I'm saying is that worry can never change the outcome of everything. Have you ever seen something change because you worried about it? Or because you prayed about it? Has worry changed anything, ladies and gentlemen? You know, you borrow money from the bank. They say, if you don't, if you don't do this, we're going to throw you in jail. You throw me in jail, you can't get your money back. <laughs> well, we're not going to throw you in jail then. What are you going to do? We're going to hang you by your thumbs. I don't have any. <laughs> Ah, oh, beloved, listen to me, listen to me, please. I'm saying to you, worry can never, ever change the outcome of everything, beloved. Experientially speaking, all of us could testify that one day of worrying can be more emotionally and physically exhausting than a week of hard physical work and labor. Amen? So why worry? 
So why be anxious and fear and fret, beloved? This is exactly what the devil, who was the god of this evil world system, wants you to do. Why? He wants to ruin your faith. He wants to rob your peace. And he especially wants to rob your soul. He's the god of this evil world system. God is God over everything. Satan's subordinate to him. But God is using the devil to work out his own will also. Amen? <clears throat> So, beloved, instead, God exhorts us in verses 4 through 7 to let your faith lay hold of these three great truths. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Number one, I want you to see the promise. Number two, I want you to see the practice. And number three, I want you to see the principle. First of all, let's look at the promise in verse 4. He says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That word delight is the Hebrew word anag. And it means to be happy, pleased. It means to be blessed. It especially means to be fortunate when we delight ourselves in someone, beloved, namely here the Lord, and it means to experience great joy and pleasure in his presence. You know when you have somebody that you really love? Uh, I remember years ago when I, I used to build swim pools when I first came out of the Marine Corps, and the person I worked for had a whole crew, but come September, a lot of people were being laid off, and they had, they had gotten the job before I got the job. And so he lays all these people off, and he keeps me. So finally I went up to him, and I said, Joe, why are you keeping me? He says, two reasons. Number one, you're a good worker. I said, thank you. He says, number two, I can't hire Jerry Lewis. <laughs> you know, the comedian? Because <laughs> I was always working, right? I'll never forget this guy, Joe. He had four arms on him like Popeye, right? And this is when uh, there was there were... When you go to a townhouse and say, thank you for not smoking. And Joe was the most laid-back guy you ever met. But he was as strong as a bull. He had four arms like, a, like Popeye. So I walk into him to the townhouse because we had to pull some electrical permits. So I go in and the guy comes up to Joe and he says, thank you for not smoking. He goes, don't thank me, I'm smoking. He says, <laughs> <laughs> All right. he says, don't thank me. He says, I'm smoking. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. But anyways, the, you like to be in people's presence. There's some people you don't want to be in their presence. Amen. There's other people you can't wait to be in their presence. They uplift you. They encourage you. They strengthen you. They teach you, beloved. Listen, you're a prisoner of your own mind. If you want to grow, you need to rub shoulders with me, and I need to rub shoulders with you because you know what I don't know, and I know what you don't know. Amen. And so you can't just isolate yourself like that. His iron sharpeneth iron, Solomon, and so sharpeneth the countenance of a friend. So people cut themselves off a lot of times. And they, they try to hang out with people that are so-called, quote, quote, dumber than them or don't know as much as them so they can look superior. But let me tell you something, you're dumbing yourself down. Because if you want to grow, you need to be with somebody that knows more than you do. You know, Confucius said this, he says, when the student is ready... The teacher is everywhere. Boy, isn't that true. My Kung Fu instructor taught me that. When the teacher is ready, excuse me, when the student is ready, he says the teacher is everywhere. My dad says to me, Joel, every man is your teacher. And beloved, I took that to heart as a kid. Whenever I would work with an electrician, whatever, show me, what are you doing? How come you're doing that? And I wanted to learn. How about you? Teach me. I want to know this. So show me. I don't want to stop growing, do you? <laughs> I do here, but I don't. <laughs> you know, people have six-pack eggs. I got a can uh, abs. I got a keg. <laughs> right. right, Tom? We know what we're doing. <laughs> well, beloved, I, I, there's no way I'll be able to finish this in time here because I've got about. You want me to finish it? You sure? Okay, I'll speed it up. Look at verse number five. <laughs> <laughs> we have to walk like this here. So look at verse number three. The promise, beloved. It means 
when we enjoy God's pleasure and pro, uh, joy and, and presence, beloved, it means we feel blessed and privileged to intimately know God as our Heavenly Father and as Abba through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And beloved, to delight in the Lord means we consider it the highest privilege, the highest honor of our life to be able to now associate and keep company with Him in the Spirit and bask in His glorious presence and majestic uh, being, beloved, in heavenly places in Christ. Christ has introduced us to the God of the universe and God says, I want to hang out with you. Do you want to hang out with me is what he's saying. How? By spending time with him in prayer. How? By spending time with him in worship and praise. How? By spending time with him in fellowship. How? By spending time with him in jail. I mean, <laughs> you want to talk about a Freudian slip. I, you can tell I just came off vacation, right? <laughs> I'm in in church. <laughs> oh, cut it out. Hush up. <laughs> How in the world did that ever slip out? <laughs> ah, I'm imprisoned by my thoughts. <clears throat> oh, pff, you didn't get it, so. <laughs> I can't even see what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay, where am I, Joel? All right. <clears throat> I'm in jail. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, uh, beloved, what I'm saying is this here. By taking Holy Communion, we, when we have communion, everybody should be here. Because that's when the church triumphant in heaven, the church militant on earth merges together and we all fellowship. There's something supernatural about taking Holy Communion. Amen? And we need to understand that. A lot of us just go mechanically through the motions. I've showed up, here I am, pass the cup, pass the bread. But there's more to it than that, ladies and gentlemen. God wants us to delight in him. Amen? <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, beloved, that's why James says, the four ready says, draw nigh to God. Draw nigh. What do you do to draw nigh to God? You pray, you worship, you seek him in his word, beloved. You come to his house, you fellowship with the saints. Delight yourself in the Lord, not delight yourself in all the worldly things. Delight yourself in the Lord, Yehovah. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. Beloved, do you draw nigh to God like that? Do you delight yourself in the Lord? Is it your all-consuming passion of your life to get closer and to know, uh, know that as you do this, you move his heart knowing that he promises to get closer to you? That means so much to me. God, I, I was praying this morning. I said, Lord, I want heaven. I want you to be able to say in heaven, Pastor Joel is my friend. Like Daniel was your friend. Like Abraham was your friend. Like Moses was. I want you to be able to say, Pastor Joel, he's my friend. Not in jail. He's my friend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we don't have to go to jail for him, by the way. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. And so, beloved, I'm asking you this here. Do you try to get closer to God? Is he the delight of your life? Is he your all in all? Is he the center of your life? Is he, listen to me, the core of your being? Are you so busy, worried about everything else around you? How are you going to do That God, you've relegated him to uh, second or third or fifth in your life? Is that what you've done? I hope not, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> If so, beloved, listen, God, if God is delighted in your life, look what he says in verse 4. That he'll give you the desires of your heart. Mishallah, that is the deep innermost requests and petitions of your heart. The deep innermost wishes and wants, the longing, the yearning, the cravings of your heart. But beloved, before God gives you the desires of your heart, you first must make him the desire and delight of your heart. Amen. God has your heart. Once God has your heart, beloved, then he knows that your heart will want and desire what his heart wants and desires, and this will make you a better Christian. Amen? Lord, here's my heart. God says, Joel, I want your heart, because if I got your heart, I'm going to give you my heart. And if I give you my heart, you're going to want what I want. You're going to desire what I desire. You're going to hate what I hate. Amen? Solomon again and again and I preached it to you. Son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. I don't want your money. I don't want your car. I don't want your home. Give me your heart. 
That's what I want. I want your heart. I want your heart. I want your heart. Why? Because if I have your heart, I have your love, and I have your life. Come on and say amen. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. You see, beloved, once you give God your heart, and He's got your heart, I want to tell you something, beloved, and He's given you His heart, you're going to crave and desire moral, spiritual things. You're going to de- crave and desire holy, righteous, and godly things, and eternal and everlasting things. You're not going to care a whit about these temporal and transient material things except that which you need to survive in this world. Amen? Honestly, beloved, I, I, from my lips to the Lord's ears, I, I say all the time, I said, what's the, when I'm praying to God, what's the one thing that I would hold on to in this life? Sorry, Ellie. The one thing I would hold on to is my salvation and my God. What, would I, what material possession would... Beloved, whatever I've got in my life, whatever you have, it's gravy. It's the goodness of God. It's the blessings that God has given you in your life. That's all. Amen? If you've got God, you've got everything. And the more of God you want, the less of the things of this world you want. Amen? Jesus said, the foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay. He was, in, he was uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Indebted to no one. Amen, beloved? He was as free as a bird. He trusted God to give him food, to give him place to sleep, to give him money. People gave money to him. So, beloved, let me just move along right here. <clears throat> Because God wants us to know this, that you are only passing through this world. This world is not your home, is it? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, I know there is no one but you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what would I do? The heavens, uh, angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Amen. I'm just passing through this world of the celestial city of the kingdom of God. How about you? The heavenly Jerusalem, with its streets of gold, where God will wipe away all tears from my eyes. And there'll be no more pain. And there'll be no more sorrow. Amen. So I'm saying delight yourself in the Lord, beloved, and you'll get these heart desires from him. That's the uh, um, promise. Let me give you the practice, beloved. Look what he says in verse 5 and 6. He says, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. <clears throat> commit thy way, that galal derek. Beloved, it means that to stop yourself from being a fretter, then you are to collect. That word literally means to roll up, to compile together the sum of all your moral and spiritual convictions, the sum of your conduct the sum of your conversation, the sum of your character and commitment and loyalties and every area and aspect of your life, and then you ought to dedicate and devote and entrust it unto the Lord. Lord, here it is. Here's my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all yours. Take it. That's what it means to commit yourself unto the Lord, trusting that he will providentially rule and reign over you as a kind and righteous and compassionate king, and trusting that he will rule and reign over you as uh, uh, as a providentially beloved, and govern and guide your life aright as a divine chaperone. He'll lead you right. He'll steer you right. He'll direct you right. Trusting that. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I've got a chance of a lifetime to do this and do that. If it takes you from the Lord, don't take that chance, that chance of a lifetime. Stay with the Lord. Amen. He may allow that to come into your life to test you, to see what you're going to do. Anything that draws you away from God is never from God. Would you say Amen. Drives you away from a good sin hating devil stomping pulpit pounding window railing shingle pulling blood born again Sabbath keeping Judeo Christian church anything that takes you away from that you don't want it in your life that's Satan dangling the carrot before you Amen so beloved let me ask you this do you let Christ sit on the throne of your heart or do you sit on the throne of your heart do you rule and reign over your life is Christ the ruler and reigner of your life you hear me now beloved 
Trusting in him, <clears throat> excuse me, committing your way to him means you know that he'll always look out for your best interest. He'll always look out for your greatest cares and concerns, your greatest desires and wants in life. Oh, hear me now. That's why the Bible says that you're to cast your care upon him. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and what? Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 115, 12, that the Lord hath been mindful of us, and he will bless us. Amen? So what am I saying? I'm saying commit thy way unto the Lord, submit thy way unto the Lord, remit thy way unto the Lord, beloved. And I want to tell you something, do it now, beloved. And if you do that, he promises I will give you and you and you the desires of your heart if you'll do that. Will you commit yourself to the Lord? And lastly, the principle of love. Look what he says in verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices. Beloved, instead of the threatened torrent of the chaotic turmoil and confusion in this world, God expects his people, he says, to rest in him. Now that word rest, daman, means to stand still. It means to hold your peace. To remain calm, confident, convinced that your God not only sits on the throne of the universe, but that he's also in sovereign control of everyone and everything else that's here, ladies and gentlemen. So you have nothing to fret about because you're resting in God. Why did this happen? My God allowed it. The devil attacked me. Why? I'm going to Listen, beloved, you can't be a great spiritual warrior unless you're getting attacked by the devil. You're not going to learn how to fight in a spiritual battle. You're not going to learn how to commit the word of God and use it. The Bible tells us the sword of the spirits, the only offensive weapon we have is the word of God. So God allows the devil to attack you and attack you and attack you. Why does he do it? He does it to make you stronger. Amen? You don't want to be some wuss with Jello in your spine, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You need a little resistance. That's how you build the muscle. You rip the fibers down so your body can build them up again. So I'm saying, beloved, if you're trusting in God's protection and power and he's your refuge and your shelter, beloved, amidst the evil and upheaval of this sinful and doomed topsy turvy evil world system, then he says, you're not going to worry about these wicked devices, is what he says in verse number 7. And that word wicked devices, mazin ma, means where no evil, no plots, no evil plans or problems, none of these things can ever defeat you, destroy you, beloved, discourage you. You expect it. I, I, I said to the Lord when I went, on, on Saturday night as I was praying, I said, tomorrow I go back to work, Lord. And I expect what's to come. Give me the grace. Give me the power. Give me the strength. Give me the discernment. Give me the perception. And give me the ability to be able to deal with it all at my stage and age. Give me the ability to do it. Let me close with this. Look at verses 38 and 40, the same chapter. Psalm 37, verses 38 through 40. He says, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Of course, he's talking about the end of the world here. We know when Jesus comes, that happens. But, conversely, the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Psalm 46, 1. The, God is our refuge and strength in the present, uh, uh, in uh, the time of trouble. That's that. Yeah, God is our refuge and strength. Okay. Verse 40. And the Lord shall help them and the Lord shall deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked, and the Lord shall save them. Why? Because they trust in him. So here's the conclusion of my sermon. You, all of you are saying, gee, you know, Pastor, I, I've been here long enough to have to shave again. <laughs> the evening news has come on. I didn't want to make this a three-parter. So, beloved, I'll not be afraid of, for God says in verse 38, notice what he says, he'll destroy all my enemies. 
So I'll not be afraid of it. God says in verse 39 that he's my salvation and strength in a time of trouble. And so I'll not be afraid of ladies and gentlemen, because he says in verse 40, he's my deliverer, my helper. He is my Lord and my Savior. He will save me. Amen? So I'll not be afraid of how about you? I want you to leave here today and say, you know what? Pastor Joel kept me in. I got blisters on my uh, back of my legs. Uh, you thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? No way. But I learned something. I'll not be a fretter. I'm not going to be glued to the TV news. I'm not going to be glued to social media. I'm not going to chase the news all the time. I'm going to chase my God. I'm going to commit my way to God. I'm going to delight myself in God. I'm going to rest in my God. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'll have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Let's go to the throne of grace.